Find the Way, a show helping you find the way in this journey called life. I'm here in the studio with Dr. Mike Sherboneau, and my name is Ashley. Hey, Ashley. Uh, welcome back. You've been away for a while. You've been traveling the globe. I have been away. New music. Things have been changing up since I've been there. And yeah, I've been uh, around to the other side of the world, spent some time in India. Tell us one of the things about India that was really shaping for you because you're involved with an organization called the Bible League of Canada. Uh, yeah, and we were able to take a group of donors over there to see the work that's being done. But it's interesting, as we got off the plane and off the bus and we're walking the streets, the amount of chaos that's happening and the way that people live, the poverty, the extreme smells, the extremes of everything and uh, so that's actually, that's the hardest thing to deal with. It's not like what we would see when we walk on the streets here. But as you talk about the chaos of life over there, just the, the visible chaos, what we often find here in North America is the internal chaos. It's like there's a storm blowing all the time. Absolutely. Oftentimes when you come back from a place like India, people will say, oh, you must feel so much more grateful to live here. But I said, the interesting thing is, People are very broken there and their brokenness is just, it's all around. You can see it. But here, we're just better at hiding our brokenness. Sure, we have social services and certain things to help with poverty, but it's the same issues actually in India as, as it is in Canada. It's the same issues everywhere, which leads us into uh, the beginning of six weeks as we're going to be talking about a whole new theme. And I've given a title to it. It's called Climate Changes. Because as we think about the climate changes as around the world, we watch the Weather Network if you're really bored. Uh, did I say bored? you got to be <laughs> bored to watch the Weather Network. But, you know, as you watch that, you just see constant changes. And I want to talk about how to change relationships uh, and make what is is good even better and perhaps some things just need total mop up but we're going to be looking at things like changing the climate of your home is going to be one of the things we're going to talk about a plan for parenting we're going to give a couple weeks to that and then i'm also going to talk about a big one we're going to talk about changing the climate of marriage mm. and you know how to move things from frigid to warm from uh, dead you know a lack of passion to, to bring the passion back That's so right. people will be tuning into that i know Dwayne, the guy who produces our program he's going to be listening in especially for that one aren't you Dwayne? but we're yes, glad you're with us on find the way and so in just a moment, we're going to be back and we're going to talk about this climate change and we're going to look at it through the whole avenue of encouragement. What does it mean to encourage? Because that definitely affects the environment in a home and a relationship. Um, so you can find us online at findtheway.faith and we'll be back in just a moment. Well, we're glad that you're joining us on Find the Way. Online, find us at findtheway.faith. And we're here from coast to coast, from Vancouver all the way to the Maritimes. I'm here with Dr. Mike Sherboneau, and we're going to be looking at this topic of climate change, and in particular, the winds of change. Thanks, Ashley. And as we begin uh, this series of talks, uh, all of us are want to see our relationships go the distance. We want to see things that are healthy and well. But a lot of times we stumble and we're afraid, you know, to go get help. Uh, for those of you on the West Coast, you know, the Vancouver Canucks, they went through a big coaching uh, change. Uh, they got rid of the, you know, out with the old and in with the new. We're not sure who the new will be yet, but they said we got to change things up. But have you ever thought about getting someone to coach you and, and to help you? And today I want to take you through the timeless uh, pages of God's Word that will help be a coach to you, to be a guide to you. And actually in the book of Psalms, there's a verse that says, your word is a light to my path and a lamp to my feet. It's almost like God says, I want you to live well. I want you to do relationships well. If I pause and, and go way back to uh, when the earth's crust had just formed or my first year of college, it's all about the same. Um, I remember something from those early days. I don't remember a lot from college, but uh, something the prof said is always stuck in my mind and it really impacts the climate of your home. He said, your words invite people to live or die. Now Solomon wrote about that as well. Solomon was the third king of Israel and he knew well the journey of his father, David. Do you remember David, the guy who wrote the 23rd Psalm and fought the giant Goliath, that guy? Well, Solomon knew how powerful words could be to shape one's future and present. Just like my prof said, your words invite people to live or die. And the tongue is powerful in the way it either cuts 
or caresses people. Likely, as I'm teaching right now, some of you are beginning to think about words that have been said to you, words that have just buried you and brought you under. We've been watching with intrigue the American political scene and uh, the White House uh, spokesperson, Sean Spicer. I mean, he's been caught several times in the words that he's been saying. And just because of uh, lack of knowledge or just saying it the wrong way. But here's what Proverbs has to say, because what you say in your home, what you say to the people you see every day, what you say to your son or daughter is shaping them. Proverbs 15 verse 4 says, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. I love that. But a deceitful tongue or a lying tongue crushes the spirit. Has anybody ever lied about you and destroyed you? I know what that personally feels like when people have said things that just aren't true and it can destroy you. But the psalmist also said something else in Psalm 19, verse 14. He said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my lips be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's really easy for me to point my finger at other people for all the wrong things they have said to other people or perhaps to me. But the big check here also is on me. And it says the psalmist was being honest. He said, God, he said, help me so that the way that I think about people and the things that I say really honor you. Because Solomon also went on to say this, that reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I think, uh, Ashley, of John Radford, who's been on our show many, many times. And when I think of the tongue of the wise, I think of people like John. Many times he's been used to negotiate conflicted parties, to bring them together, whether it's been uh, um, government and uh, First Nations, whether it's been business people who have been at odds with each other. And he's even worked within church and religious circles, bringing people together. Solomon knew it well. He said, reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And, uh, and then an anxious heart weighs a man down is another scripture, but a kind word cheers him up. So in the second half of the show today, I want to talk about the power of encouragement and how we speak into people's lives. But let me cut to the chase. While we all have elevated opinions of ourselves, what is the climate in your home, in your work right now? Your language can become a thermostat creating a cold, impersonal, or discouraging atmosphere, or it can be like a welcoming, warm blanket on a cold day. We often talk about knowing God's joy and the presence of His Spirit in our lives on this program. But have you ever thought about whether you are encouraging or not? We might say, yes, I am. But you know, not always true. Recently, my wife overheard two husbands talking about gifts for their wives. And she heard them say this. The one guy said to the other guy, he doesn't buy souvenirs or little presents for his wife. He says, I buy expensive gifts and and I buy fresh flowers for my wife. And the other husband said, oh, I buy flowers for my wife. But my, and his wife is rolling her eyes. And then my wife, Terry, tells me this. She said, she finally pipes up and says, when do you buy me flowers anyways? He said, oh, he said at least once every month. She said, you don't buy me flowers at all. This is all taking place in the store. He said, well, I buy you daisies, but they're not in season all the time. And at that point, Terry, my wife said, his wife got up and left. So all that to say, your perception of reality might be a whole lot different than what really is. So how are you really doing? What is the climate in your home? Have you asked God to fill you with the Spirit so that you'll be an encouragement? Words like, you did well, or uh, you got a C. Well, tremendous. It could have been an F. So we're going to celebrate a C. And I know when I was going through high school, a C was a cause for a party. And maybe some of you can resonate with that. Um, You know, maybe it's a teacher. You could say to them, thank you for teaching my children, for making the meals on Wednesday night. Uh, for whatever you do. I had a moment recently when I was at the doctor's office and I was talking to him and it was a doctor, uh, Jim Park, who's taken great care of our family for years and years. And I realized I hadn't thanked them. And I just paused and said, I want you to know how much I really appreciate the care you have given to our family. And, uh, and those words are important. I know how much they mean to me. We're going to come back in a moment and talk about changing the climate of your home through words of encouragement. And Ashley's going to come back and do some teaching with me on that whole subject. We'll be right back in just a moment.
I like this topic, the winds of change, and looking at the whole、uh, emphasis around encouragement. You said a quote at the beginning that stands out to me invite people to, that our words invite people to live or to die. And I think that's so true because even amongst my friends, so often what I'll hear in conversation is people are still dealing with things that they heard as a child. Whether it was from a parent or from a teacher or something like that. And if it negatively impacted them, it's like they carry with it with them throughout their life. Almost like they can never fully get over it because those words stay in their mind. How do you、and、think we can get over it, Ashley? Well, it has to, the only way of approaching it, I think, is bringing it to the gospel. It's actually looking and saying, what's the truth of what God says about who I am? It's. Ultimately, the way we work through it, because so often we've heard and we've believed then lives growing up. So, our words aren't just words, but that's a phrase I often hear amongst my friends too. Oh, those were just words. But do we actually put meaning behind the words that we say? And when people say things to us, do we actually believe it? Yeah, there's an old adage sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And what I say to that is. <laughs> You're not allowed to really do that on air, but I just did it. You know what? That's a bunch of hogwash. Yeah. But here's some words that are powerful, words that are shaping. And I want you to listen to this song by Hillsong United called Oceans. And then we'll be right back with Ashley Sherbino to talk more about changing the climate in your home with words of encouragement. You call me out upon the waters, the great I know. Where she may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. Find the way you can find us at findtheway.faith. And as we talk about climate changes and in particular the winds of change, how is the wind of change blowing in your home or at your workplace or with the people you're around? And Ashley, you're going to pick up the subject as we talk a little bit about words of encouragement. So, what was on your mind as, as you were addressing it just before we broke for the song?、Mm-mm. Well, actually, something I started to think about was recently I was listening to a prof、uh, from UBC, and he's what's called the happiness guru. His name is Dr. 
Dr. Mike Hold, Mark Holder. What's interesting, though, and this ties to encouragement, is that he says a key to happiness is focusing on what's right and good instead of what's wrong. And I think that's like one of the key principles in the home. We're often so good at pointing out what we don't like about the other person, what's not working or what they didn't do that they said that they were going to do. Yeah, we think the C on the sweater is for correct as yeah. opposed to captain or coach. <laughs> and <laughs> That was brilliant, I think. Oh, yeah. Encourage me with that word. Uh, I just that's came up right. with that on the, the spot. way to go. Yeah. Good. Um, but instead, so we can see so much what's broken, what's not working instead of what's actually right. And that's where encouragement starts. Encouragement wow. stems from seeing, you know, this is, this is wonderful about you. This is something that's working. I see these abilities inside of you. And even if something's just starting to emerge, it's helping to draw that out of a person. So how do you change the negative habits? Because probably everybody listening to some degree, if they were honest, would say, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of always picking up on the negative thing. Do this or do that. And, uh, you know, it was like some of my teachers, I thought they got perverse pleasure out of marking X on my papers. Yeah. Well, I think, I think you actually have to commit to not just recognizing what's wrong. So start with everything that's working that is right. Everything like if your child's coming home and they have a bad report card that they're about to put in front of you, you can focus on that and make that the center of attention or you can recognize it and you can also pull out 10 other things the child has done right and that are working really well. And it's actually the way of getting them to move in a direction that you want them to go to. Help some parents out right now because on different occasions you've gone into the classroom to speak about uh, childhood and juvenile depression, sometimes related to sports and just life living up to peer pressure, the pressure of Facebook. What do, would you say to parents right now to change the climate in their home? Yeah, we deal a lot with anxiety in the classroom too, right? And tactics around that. And like you said, on the field with sports. I, I'm overwhelmed that children would feel so much anxiety. Like they should they shouldn't when they're so young. Oh, and it seems to be a growing epidemic for sure. But this is actually one of the tactics that we use is don't just focus in on the depression and anxiety, but look at what are all the things around that are working and that are going really well. And what are all the support systems and other places where you can encourage? Because if you spend your time there, it will actually fill in the holes in the other areas. And that's what I'm saying. We need to spend our time reflecting on who a person really is and what we really love about them. And that's actually, that's not just some nice psychology concept that I'm, uh, that I'm suggesting here. It's actually straight from the Bible. It's, it's the way Jesus is. It's why people want to be with Jesus. He noticed them. And what he noticed was who they really are. And he was able to draw that out of them and encourage them through that. He saw past the externals, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Like Absolutely. even those rough and tumble fishermen that probably use a lot of four letter words, he saw incredible potential in them and he used them to shape the world. Yeah. You think, you think about the sinful woman who came and knelt down at his feet and was wiping, uh, wiping his feet and everyone was appalled because she should never be in the room where Jesus was and doing that. But he said, I see her and loved her. And he saw her heart and the fact that she was loving towards him, that she wanted forgiveness, that she desired, desired that. So it's, he was always drawing out that side. And that's what I think has to be the premise behind encouragement. We can say false stuff or we can really truly see a person and, and pull from that. And it wasn't as if Jesus was accommodating their sin. They no. knew that he knew what was going on inside of them, but he was calling them to a different level. And that's what we're calling people to a different level that you can change the climate of your home. When you ask Christ for his help, when you invite the Holy spirit to come and dwell within us. It almost seems counterproductive, right? But if you, coming back to this whole thing of sin, Jesus would recognize it. But if all you do is focus on the sin, you're actually not going to get very far. But if you focus on everything else around it to help move the person out of that, you're going to get a lot further. This is the whole concept behind encouraging one another. What do you do in the work environment? Because you also lead a team of people, um, you know, for the job that actually pays you money. Because you do this one for free <laughs> just because of, uh, you know, your commitment to helping people rethink life. But how do you deal with encouragement in the workforce? Uh, well, 
Yeah, it's it's another challenging place, right? Because um, especially it's like you want to sit down and often point out what's not working or what's not right. And uh, so I think I have to be committed to the same things. I have to be committed to seeing the people, getting to know people, generating interest in the people that I'm leading and um, and seeing things even that they're not recognizing inside of themselves that I can start to encourage them with. And at the and it, you're still speaking, you still have to speak the truth. Like sometimes there's hard conversations that I have to have in the workplace, but you can have a hard conversation and still have the person intact at the other end of the conversation. Ashley, I appreciate what you've been sharing today. You're uh, listening to Find the Way. I'm going to come back in a moment and tie up some of the scripture teaching today by telling the story of two men. One was in a desperate situation, and his good lifelong buddy comes along and speaks words of encouragement into him that gave him the strength to press on. Well, welcome back to Find the Way. And as you've been listening to our show, you probably noticed that we changed up the little tune, the little jingle that's in between the the segments of our show. And uh, that's because I wanted to encourage my wife, Terry. She loves the band Chicago. That's kind of dating her a little bit. So if you've been listening to that and wondering, yes, that is Chicago. And uh, I just love uh, the sound of the brass. And I figure if I can encourage her, I'm going a long ways toward climate change in my own home. But, you know, all of us need encouragement. And as I think back on my life, uh, there was a couple individuals who really spoke into my life. The first man has, has been dead now for about seven or eight years, but his name was Bob Wright. And in the first church that I pastored in downtown Toronto, I would call him on the phone. He was a big executive for Shell Oil, and his secretary would put me through to him. And his opening lines, you ready for this? He would always answer this way. Every time he would say, Michael, my hero, how are you today? Now, initially, I thought the guy was nuts. I actually (laughs) thought he was crazy. But there would be times uh, when I got discouraged and I would call this high profile executive just to hear him say, Michael, my hero, how are you today? And what that guy knew and understood was the power of a word of encouragement. And, you know, when nobody was giving me any encouragement, I knew where I could call just to hear that line. Well, I'll flip it ahead. And I I remember another experience when I was actually asked to go and speak to the Toronto Blue Jays. And it was a a chapel service. They were playing the Minnesota Twins. Folks, let me tell you, it was really hard for me to pray for the Minnesota Twins. I'm Canadian through and through. (laughs) I wanted the Jays to win, but I did the chapel service for the Twins. I'm in there with the, uh, the Blue Jays. And these are some of just the outstanding MVP players. And when the service was over and the running out of the room, all those guys would high five me. But here's the strangest thing. It's what puts, makes a team a winning team. And Ashley, we were talking about what do you say in the work environment? I heard those ball players say to each other words like, man, we're going to get it today. We're going to win. I, I heard them actually say, I love you, brother. And I'm encouraging you. And I'm thinking, whoa, these are professional baseball players saying powerful words of encouragement. And then I watched them do what only ball players do. And I thought this would all be great in the local church or any place of work, (laughs) except now you'd get sued for it. They all slapped each other on the butt as they're walking out the door. Let's go get them. And maybe that's where we have to draw the line. But it was a powerful moment. You see, here's the principle. Encouragers help you to hang on instead of letting go. You never have to look far to see someone who needs encouragement. And in the passage before us today, David is running for his life from a man named King Saul. And of all people, it's Saul's son who comes to see David. And his name is Jonathan. Jonathan wanted to encourage David. And we read in 1 Samuel chapter 23, And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at a place called Horesh. And it says he encouraged him in the Lord. And translated, the word encouragement means he strengthened his hand in God. And he said, Don't be afraid, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You will be king over Israel, and I'll be next to you. Well, You don't have to look far, as I said, to find someone who needs encouragement. David is at a place of desperation. He's so low, he could have been, 
you know, he could have played handball against the curb, as the, uh, the cliche goes. Matter of fact, in the chapter before, it says that everyone who was in distress and debt and discontent gathered around David. I mean, not the most positive people in the world. Uh, and David's trying to hold together a pack of renegade, renegades, and they would hide in caves. And this particular time, they're hiding in the cave of Adullam. Trust me, folks, it was no Holiday Inn. And trying to encourage this group of motley men, there's about 400 men who are running with David for their lives. It was a hard task. And Jonathan comes along. The Bible says that Saul was seeking him every day. Talk about the pressures that would discourage you. But the son of King Saul, Jonathan, comes to him. And we read it says that he went and he encouraged him in the Lord. If you doubt that David was discouraged, then listen to his own description when he writes in Psalm 57. He said, my soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. Wow, that is poetic literature. See, encouragers help to restore your strength. We read in verse 16 that Jonathan rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in the Lord. And the first thing that an encourager does is that it helps you to find your purpose in life. Normally, when you encourage people, it's a choice that you make. A lot of times, you're going to be inconvenienced. So, you know what? Get over it. Suck it up, princess, but do it. I really believe that God wants us to be stepping out of our comfort zone to encourage and help people. And Jonathan didn't say nice, cheery phrases, but he rather reminded him that God was in control. He said, God's not going to fail you or forsake you, regardless of what you're going through. And, uh, and so many verses would later be the repertoire of David. He was the one who penned that God is our refuge and strength, a present help in time of trouble. I wonder if he was thinking of that day when Jonathan came as God's representative and said, hey, God is still with you. It's not over yet. Because encouragers help to restore your sight. And Jonathan said, don't fear. He said, don't fear. He said, you will still be king. What a hard thing for him to say because he was the rightful heir to the throne. But he knew that God was mapping something out. Hey, can I encourage you today with, on behalf of all of us at Find the Way to think how you can be an encouragement in someone's life. I call it giving people a lift. Maybe by saying something verbally to them perhaps writing them a note, inspire someone who is down to keep pressing on, help them to get focused back on God, or thank someone for what they do. Be specific. You see, the encouragement lift helps you to hang on instead of letting go. And may God help you to be that source of encouragement in people's lives today. Thanks, Mike. I love that story about David and Jonathan. And to think that Jonathan believed the best thing he could do with his life is to give it to David and to be that source of encouragement to him. That is huge to give his life. I know it's powerful. And so I like what you said, encouraging, restoring people's sight, pointing them back to the focal point of where it's all at. So help us to be an encouragement to you by writing to us. And we'd love to pray for you and uh, to hear your thoughts and your ideas. You can find us at findtheway.faith. We're going to be back and we're going to continue next week with the winds of change. Ashley, uh, thank you for what you've shared today. It was such an encouragement to hear your perspective as we do life in the uh, the big arena of life. And uh, sometimes there's a lot of knocks and bumps that people face but how important today to encourage people. So let me close by saying this. You have incredible worth to our Lord. He gave his life for you. That's what we celebrated on Easter. And be encouraged with this, that as you ask God for help to be your Savior and Lord, he will always hear that prayer. He's there to walk with you through the midst of it all. Thanks for listening to Find the Way.